All right, now we're going to do some syntheses problems. So I can uh, tell you up front, the most important factor in synthesis is whether the student has mastered the basic reactions. Um, you've got to master the basic reactions before you can even try synthesis problems. Uh, so we'll see whether we've got that mastery here. So. Okay, so here we have a synthesis problem. Now, um, notice that in a synth uh, synthesis is different from predict the products. The problems that we were just doing a minute ago were predict the products. Predict the products is when they just give you the starting material and ask you what the product is. So predict the products is if they just give you the starting materials and ask you for the product. In a synthesis, though, they give you one of the starting materials and the product. And now our job is to come up with reagents that we could add that would turn the starting material into the product. We have to come up with reagents to add that will turn this starting material into this product. And it might take more than one step. It might take three or four or five steps. Uh, all right, so we can think through uh, how we'd be doing that. Um, first of all, we almost always want to try to number here. So okay. let's put in some numbers. Uh, I'll call these one, two, three, and four. Okay. Now the purpose of the numbers is to identify the carbons in the starting material that are the same as the carbons in the product. So can you identify um, which carbon in the starting material corresponds, who's the number one carbon over here, do you think? Uh, the or maybe it would be easier to identify the, the three and the pi, four. The one on the end of the pi bond. Yeah, this seems like the number one. Maybe it would be easier to start with the three and the four. It seems pretty clear that those are the three and the four carbons over here, and then this would be the two. So the whole purpose of the numbers is that we want to give the same number to carbons in different pictures if they're the same carbon. The purpose of the numbers is to identify the carbons in different pictures that are the same carbon. Okay. All right. All right. And then we simply have to ask what changes have happened from the starting material to the product, and do we know any reagents that could allow us to make that change? All right. Um, so, uh, well, you go ahead and make a proposal. Can you see any uh, reagents we could add that would get us from the starting materials to the product here? draw what you mean by that? What reagent are you thinking about that in? You could do any OH. Okay, let's write that down. Seems like a good guess. So what do you think would happen if you put in any OH? So that's the only candidate. And so, um, and then that would uh, free up the, uh, the electrons to make a pi bond from two to one, not, right. not the uh, chlorine. Okay, great. Uh, I think that would be a good answer. That might be a full credit answer right there. Okay, so let's think through the thought process there. Um, now, so far, almost the only reactions you've learned are substitution and elimination. So you should just be asking yourself, what do I need to do here? A substitution or an elimination? Well, clearly an elimination, because elimination forms pi bonds. All right, so we want to do an elimination reaction. So do we want to do an E2 or an E1? Well, we definitely want to do two E2 for, for two reasons. First of all, you can't do an E1 in a primary. But more important, E1s are oftentimes not that great for synthesis, because remember, they're usually mixed with SN1. And the whole point of a synthesis is to get a pure yield. The whole point here is to get a pure yield. Um, now, actually, there, there are some exceptions to that. There, there are some ways to get a pure yield from E1. I don't know. We'll see if your class has covered that. Um, but the more important thing is we certainly can't do an E1 on a primary. Okay. So um, would this give us uh, really an E2 and not an SN2? Well, yeah, it would. Um, although it's a little bit of a close call here. 
Uh, if you look at your chart here, we have a primary and a non-bulky base. A primary and a non-bulky base usually gives you SN2, which is not what we want. A primary and a non-bulky base usually gives us SN2. However, I think you would make it here because there's so much substitution of the beta carbon. In fact, here, this is the first time that we've seen a beta carbon that's tertiary. And if you, now we're in the row on page three for a tertiary beta carbon, and that really would give us E2 as the major product, even with a non-bulky base. Um, but why should we cut it so close? Since we want E2 and not SN2, should we use a bulky base or a non-bulky base? Remember, we should, we should use a bulky base. Yeah, even though you're going to kind of get what you want here probably, it might not be a pure yield. Okay. The whole point of synthesis is to get the purest yield possible. Well, let's put in the bulkiest base we can think of. Let's put in sodium methoxide. Uh, let's put in tert-butyl oxide. And now we're sure to get a good yield. Go ahead and draw the mechanism for what would happen then. If you wanted to, you could draw it in this picture. Oh, okay. it doesn't matter. decided not to use the sodium hydroxide. Oh, okay. In fact, we should probably erase that. Good. And you don't need to bother drawing the product, because this is the product. Was the product here. Okay, um, so the best answer here is a very bulky base. Um, like I said, you might get full credit for sodium hydroxide, but maybe not because even though the major mechanism with sodium hydroxide would probably be E2, you probably would get a lot of competing SN2 as well. So it's best to use the bulkiest base you can. So what we want to do over do here is use synthesis strategies. Okay. So let's say let's say you wanted to do a uh, you wanted to use a negative oxygen to form a pi bond. If you want to use a negative oxygen to form a pi bond. Uh, uh, real yeah. quickly, just in the answer. Oh, did we get that right? Or wrong? No, they have it with the, the potassium. Do we have that? Oh, yeah, yeah. that's the counter ion. Um, I, I think you would get full credit either way, but maybe it's a little safer to show the counter ion. Okay. Okay. So yeah, in reality, we don't pick up, we don't take something off the shelf that's charged. Everything on our shelf is neutral. So okay. there's always going to be a counter ion. Okay. So it's safest to show this counter ion. Okay. This could be either sodium or potassium. Okay. okay. Uh, but they did use tributyl oxide on it. Okay, good. All right, so to review the strategies, let's say you want to use a negative oxygen for an elimination. Well, do you want to make it bulky or non-bulky? Bulky. And you might as well make it as bulky as possible. So, if you want to do an E2, just go ahead and put in tributyl oxide. And I guess you might as well get into the habit of putting in the counter ion. And LDA is the other, um, and there's three now. Thank you, I always make that mistake, that's right. Oh, I made that mistake up here too, huh? All right, so it wouldn't be, have be bulky without those three methyl groups. Okay. On the other hand, suppose that you want a negative oxygen to act as a nucleophile in an SN2 reaction. Oh, wait. Then you'd want the least possible amount of bulk. Well, you could put in, say, meth oxide. That would probably give you SN2, but why take any chances? Let's use the least amount of bulk possible. And then if you want to put in the counter ion, you can put in the sodium or potassium counter ion. So that's our synthesis strategy. If we want a negative oxygen to do an SN2, you probably want the least bulk possible, or for an E2, the most bulk possible. There might be some other considerations, but those are the key ideas. Okay. We basically figured that out. Uh, we just had to say that we wanted to use the most bulky thing that we could. 